All right, Genesis chapter 17. Now, um, we're going to be covering a lot within these timelines, so that's why I drew it all out. Uh, we might be covering tons and tons of verses. I don't think I ever did this in any Genesis study. It might be just on this one. So, because there's not too much to com contemplate on one or two verses here, it's just going to be an explanation. So, we'll see how much ground we cover. Let's start off with Genesis chapter 17. We left off at verse 12. Genesis chapter 17. We left off at verse 12. The Bible reads here, And uh, he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Now, God is saying anyone that is about reaching eight uh, years, uh, uh, not eight years, eight days old, that uh, baby is going to be circumcised among you. You. So remember, the context was about circumcision from the previous three verses. So he's giving them the instructions and the specifics on circumcision. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house. So that's every male, every baby that is male, that um, the baby is going to be circumcised, basically. If the baby is born within your own household, but not just Abraham's household or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. So even any baby that has been bought with money. So you can see this sounds like slavery right here. So remember that time that it was normal that they had slaves during that time period. And I'm not going to explain the apologetics or the reasons why. I've done that many times in other teachings. So of any stranger, so meaning that Abraham obviously bought a slave from someone that is not of his own people. So we've seen one example with Egypt where Pharaoh handed Abraham a group of slaves. If they're not from Abraham's seed, that male child will be circumcised, whether it's in the house or outside of the house. Point is, whoever uh, lives with Abraham they have to be circumcised. Verse 13, he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. That's self-explanatory. Anyone that's born in Abraham's household or any, uh, any baby that is within uh, the slaves that Abraham has bought, they have to be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So God says that their circumcision that they had in their flesh, that's going to be his covenant. So literal, uh, basically the circumcision that's in their flesh, God's going to see that as his covenant in their flesh. And it's going to be an everlasting covenant. It's forever. Like I told you in previous Genesis studies about Abraham and circumcision, a circumcised Jew is actually a physical sign that reminds the Lord that I made a promise that cannot be broken. So you cannot say that the Jews are cast aside today. You can't do that. Verse 14, And the uns uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. You'll notice right here that the Bible says uh, the man-child, or so the baby that is male, who is, turns out to not be circumcised, then what happens is that baby, but it's not just the baby, it's everybody we're going to find out. Every male within Abraham's household and the Jewish people who does not receive circumcision, the Bible says that that soul shall be cut off from his people. Whatever that means. I'll explain that later. He hath broken my covenant. Because the person broke God's covenant in deciding not to receive circumcision, God says that person uh, breaks God's covenant and has to be cut off from the people. Now, before I explain that phrase, let me explain a little bit more about the eight days old circumcision that we just read. Look at Leviticus 12. The passage that you want to know concerning about eight days, reaching eight days and being circumcised is in Leviticus 12 and uh, Genesis chapter 17. All right, so right now I'm not in my right state of mind, so 
If I start trying funny, forgive me, all right? Why would God say eight days old? It's very interesting that one of the scientific proofs in your Bible is actually this passage at Genesis. Now, you might say, really? That's amazing. Yeah, Leviticus 12 and uh, Genesis 17. When you do circumcision at that eighth day, they say some scientists, some medical experts say that that's when vitamin K is at its highest. So then the Lord just timed it right for the male child to be circumcised. So that's one of the evidences in your Bible. So for people to say that the Bible is a primitive book, if you've heard that before, written by primitive people, they didn't know what they were talking about, they weren't scientific experts like us today, they don't know what they're talking about. So we see here in the Bible that it is very much uh, up to date, believe it or not. It keeps up with the science. Leviticus chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean uh, seven days, according to the days of the separation, of her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. Notice right here that the male baby on the eighth day has to have uh, received circumcision on the eighth day. Look at Genesis 17 again, Genesis 17. So these are the two passages that you want to know about circumcision. Now, when we return to Genesis 17, 14, the question is the soul being cut off. So what is the soul being cut off here? The soul being cut off can refer to two things. One, it could be referring to basically being put to death. It could also refer to the sense when you are put to death at that time that you lose your salvation. Hence the term soul cut off, right? Soul being cut off. When the soul is cut off, it does sound like something that, in which you can lose your salvation. The soul cut off. Let's look at uh, several cases on this meaning. Go to Exodus 31. Exodus 31. The soul being cut off. There are two meanings to this. One is death. And then the second is basically being churched or excommunication, exiled. That's the idea. From my understanding, it seems like Dr. Ruckman originally said death and exile, but then when I looked at his more recent uh, commentaries, he only said death. So there seems to be a reason for that. I don't know why, but that's just my guess. Saying that to you, because that way you can study for yourself. That's the point of coming to this church is that not just Pastor Kim teaching you, but that you have to study for yourself, and then that way you can see for yourself, and the Lord can show you some things. Look at Exodus 31, and then we'll look at 14. Notice right here, the idea is the person is put to death when the soul is being cut off. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 14 reads, Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defileth it shall, notice right here, shall surely be put to death. So the person has to die if they break the Sabbath during the Old Testament. For whosoever doeth any work therein, notice it's explained further about what does he mean by surely be put to death. That soul shall be cut off from among his people. So notice that that soul is, in a sense, cut off, divided, separated from his own people when the person dies. When the person dies, he's away from the people. Let's look at Numbers 19, Numbers 19. If that's what the explanation, the definition is, then in Numbers chapter 19, it could also mean exile, 
The person is away, separated, divided from the people. Numbers 19 seems to show that. But majority of the passages you find, it seems to point out death, which is why it may be possible Numbers 19, the verse that I'm reading to you, I think, I think I use this as a reference to exile, but then again, it could be death right here. But I'm just trying to keep all options open, and this is probably one of the closest on exile. Now, Numbers chapter 19, verse 20, but the man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from the congregation. Okay, so we see that term again, meaning... Uh, the water of separation hath not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. Because the person is unclean, unclean, and then that soul is cut off, but then if he's, it seems to be temporary, okay? Basically, when the person gets clean again, then it seems like he can return to the group, because if you read verse 21, and it shall be a perpetual statute unto them, that he that sprinkleth the water of separation shall wash his clothes, and he that toucheth the water of separation shall be unclean, but notice, until even. So it seems like a temporary time period. It's not like the person is dead and then cannot return again. And whatsoever the unclean person toucheth shall be unclean. And the soul that toucheth it shall be unclean until even. We see a temporary time period here again. But like I said before, it could be referring to death. Let's go back to Genesis 17. Genesis chapter 17 again. Verse 15. Now remember, that I'm explaining literally every single word in every single verse. So if it sounds a little bit dreary to you or drudgery when you're hearing me explain the verses, uh, that's probably because you're thinking, oh, I already know, get to the point, or you're trying to find some kind of deep nugget. No, that's not the point of this teaching. Verse by verse, the point of this teaching, like I told you many times, is for you to understand literally every single word in the verse. And this is perhaps the most important Bible study out of every other Bible study is verse by verse. You might say, why is that? Because in verse by verse, it covers deep doctrines. It covers devotionals. It covers practical applications. It covers preaching. It covers end times. It covers everything. But most importantly, it gives you an understanding of his book. That's why we do verse by verse. That's why every single Bible-believing church you'll find, they do verse by verse Bible studies. Because it's that important. It's that important. A lot of people say, well, I don't understand the King James Bible. The words are too hard to understand. Well, you don't have that excuse now. Yeah. So if you just say, oh, I already know I understand, you just contradicted yourself or you lied or you didn't realize that before. Okay? So take this advantage to understand every word in the King James Bible. Let's look at Genesis 17 again. Genesis 17. And you can hand it over to me anytime, all right? You can hand it over to me anytime. Let's look at Genesis chapter 17, and then we'll look at verse 15. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai. So the verse is continuing that God is speaking to Abraham here, and he says, Now about Sarai, wife Sarai, you're not going to call her name Sarai anymore, but Sarah shall her name be. Instead, her name is going to be Sarah. So, Sarah means princess, for some of you who didn't know. Sarah means princess. Sarai, remember what I told you before, it, me it meant contentious woman. And there was a lot of deep nuggets I taught to you ladies about that. And that's the spirit of today's age is this one, being a Sarai, a contentious woman, rather than a Sarah. Once Sarai learned to submit to her husband and to take her role as a wife, and in the biblical role as a woman, the Lord was finally able to bless her and say that she is now princess. So now Abraham is going to call her princess rather than 
contentious woman. Imagine calling your wife that. <laughs> That's what the name means. Let's go back. Let's go back. Verse 16, and I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. So God says that I'm going to bless Sarah and then I'm going to give you, Abraham, a son by her, through her. Uh, he mentioned also over here, and that's, I notice a lot of times when I go through Genesis verse by verse, that's uh, one of those English uh, words that's always used where God is like saying, here's another thought to think about, right? Or another thing that I'm going to do for you. So whenever you see that also when God is speaking, it seems it always points out right here where God is saying, here's another thing I'm going to do, all right? Now, when God says that he's going to give Abraham a son through Sarah, you can imagine the shock within Abraham. Remember, before Abraham had faith, he believed he's going to have a child. But you're going to later find out that before he was thinking like through a different lineage. It's not going to be through Sarah. Why? Because Sarah's too old. That's why Abraham went through Hagar to produce seed. Because Abraham thought it would be that way. But God's like, no, I'm going to do it through Sarah, which is ridiculous. Only God can do something like that, no one else. It's just too ridiculous to happen. He keeps reading here at verse 16, Yea, I will bless her. So yea, meaning yes. So the idea is truly like, yes, it will happen. That's the idea for yea. He's going to bless Sarah, and she shall be a mother of nations, Kings of people shall be of her. So Sarah is going to become a mother of not just one nation, but many nations. He was a man of faith, the Bible says, so he had faith in the Lord. No, verse 17, then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. So Abraham, when the Bible says fell upon his face, then you can see right here that he must have laughed pretty hard. <laughs> So, fell upon his face. I don't know if that could be the English uh, metaphorical expression to just go like this, fell, the face falling like this and laughing. Or it could be he, he hit his hands over his face and went like this. But that's what it looked like. The point is, though, nevertheless, is that uh, he laughed pretty hard. Yeah. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart. So, he's saying to himself in his own heart. Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? So, meaning, will a child be born to a person, to anybody that's a hundred years of age? So, as I explain every word and line, look at the verse and see if it matches, okay? Because I could be lying to you, remember that? So, keep looking at that. That way, your knowledge can grow. And shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear... Meaning, and will Sarah be able to bear, will be able to have a child at 90 years of age? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Now notice right here, verse 17, Abraham is speaking to himself, verse 17. And then 18, Abraham is speaking to God. So it seems like right here, Abraham, he's... He wouldn't dare do that in front of God at verse 17, right? Because he's speaking to God and he's trying to revere him. Verse 18, Abraham is trying to, change the, uh, trying to change the direction of God's plan that don't you think Ishmael might be a better idea? So then he's saying right here, an exclamation point, because he was laughing, remember? So an exclamation point, Abraham is saying to God, oh, that Ishmael might be the one that your hand of blessing will fall upon, that his generations will live, that your blessing will fall upon his generations and through him and his lineage. Now, when you look at verse 19, and God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed. So God's saying, <laughs> he's repeating again. Uh, it's interesting right here. God said at verse 16 one time, I'm going to bless her where she's going to have a child. 16 again, he repeats again, yay, like this will really happen. I'm going to bless her. She's going to have a child. 
And then verse 19, God's just repeating the same thing. Did you get the memo, Abraham? Your wife, Sarah, will really bear a son indeed. Now, uh, there's something that I notice right here with the Lord. It's like the Lord can predict human nature. And when God gives a promise, he knows that human nature is going to forget it or laugh about it. Which is why it makes sense. If you look at verse 16, if you look at verse 16, why God mentioned also. Remember I mentioned that phrase before? It's like when God gives a promise... Sometimes we see in Scripture he repeats something, right? Especially if it's a promise. Why would he do that? Simple, because you and I are just too stupid. <laughs> it's like when God says something good to you, you forget it, you doubt it, you critique it. Or you go resort to your own method. And so, God, you can see the language here when God is speaking. It's like he's thinking in his mind, I know Abraham's human nature. So I want you to know this. It will happen. He says, also. Look at these signal words here. Also. Yay. Like, yes, it will. Yes, it will. All right? You know what the mind says all the time? No, 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 no. It's always negative. Yeah. <clears throat> and then he puts indeed. And not only that, he repeats at verse 16. He says, I'm going to bless her. I'm going to bless her. We see all these signal words. We don't understand. We don't understand. <clears throat> when we look at verse 19 again, the middle of the verse, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. So God says, you're going to call your son Isaac. Abraham, uh, not Abraham, your, son, uh, your son's name, Abraham, Isaac. That's going to be his name. So we see that Isaac's name is finally introduced. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. So God says when I establish or when I make or start a covenant, it's going to be with him, Isaac, and it's going to to be through Isaac, that's going to be an everlasting. It's going to be a, f a covenant that lasts forever. Not just Isaac, but his seed after him, who take after him. Now, we see in this passage that God has a sense of humor. For some of you who didn't know that. If Abraham's going to laugh, then God's going to just uh, joke along with Abraham. Now, you might say, why is that? So when Abraham was laughing... <clears throat> God did the joke by saying, we're going to call your son's name laughter. That's what Isaac means, for some of you who didn't know. Isaac's name means laughter. So when Abraham was laughing, and he doesn't tell the Lord that, oh man, it's so funny about a 100-year-old man and a 90-year-old woman giving birth to a child. He wouldn't dare say that, but God reads people's hearts and intentions. So God's like, okay, yeah, you don't have to say it, but I know what you're thinking, I know what you're feeling, so let's call your son's name laughter. You betcha Abraham got right with God after that. He's like, whoop, like that. He was laughing, and he was doing exclamation point at verse 18. After that, he must have calmed down. <laughs> So, God has a sense of humor. Now, when we study the nature of God, it's important to understand this. We know that God, He's all about holiness. And within holiness, we see there's a seriousness to that. And there is a soberness behind it. Uh, a lot of people uh, don't take holiness seriously nowadays, and they take it loosely. However, we go so much in the holier-than-thou role that we take our Christian too seriously and we can't learn to enjoy it we have to understand this that God he does have a sense of humor and he does promote laughter we can see several instances of that in the Bible <clears throat> I want you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 6 Luke 6 there are several cases of this we're going to look at the book of Luke chapter 6 Sometimes people have wondered, I wonder how Jesus reacted to things. 
Uh, there's a famous series now going around about the chosen, and these people try to get into the life of Jesus Christ and then see, I wonder if he had a sense of humor. And that's one of the things that you might notice from some of those directors. They try to see if Jesus may have laughed or had a sense of humor. Well, when we look at Luke chapter 6, we can see right here that Jesus, he does promote laughter. In Luke chapter 6, we read in verse 20, uh, 21, Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall what? Laugh. So notice right here that Jesus Christ, he does promote laughter. He's within an atmosphere of laughter as well. We're also going to look at Genesis 21. Genesis 21. As a matter of fact, Sarah said that God made her to laugh. That that was basically God's works and dealings, is to make us laugh. Look at Genesis chapter 21. So that's when she was able to give birth to Isaac. Look at verse 6. Genesis chapter 21 and verse 6. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that here will laugh with me. See, God, he likes it when a person laughs and then causes other people to laugh around them. So no, it's not a sin if Robert Garcia talks like Mickey Mouse and he causes one, people to, one person to laugh and everybody else to laugh around him in a serious holy church environment. Nothing wrong with that, okay? Let's look at Psalm 2. Psalm 2, yeah, thank you, Lord. Psalm 2. Psalm 2. Now, this is the strange thing with God. The strange thing with God is that he can take laughing seriously. Be believe it or not. Yeah. Some people say when you're serious, that doesn't mean that you d don't laugh. No, uh, God can take laughing seriously. And here's a very important point right here. God, when he sees these nations, you know, f uh, freaking out about, you know, what's going on with Russia, Ukraine, and the nation, Finland, and then Sweden contemplating about joining, and then all these other people gathering together as united nations, and then people crying about what's going on with the elections, and then, you know, those mules coming out, the elections are rigged and everything. You know what God's doing behind the scenes, believe it or not? He's laughing. <laughs> He's laughing. Now, you might say, How? why? This is a horrible day. Because he wants to teach you stupid yeah. people. Yes, amen. He wants to teach you stupid people how, how advanced your society, how advanced your culture, how advanced your education and civilization is. He, that's why he laughs. Because you take so much pride ever since after World War II, you see that downhill, God can see it going downhill. When Laodicea started. So then he, he was patient. He let you put it up. He let you enjoy your riches. And you thought that you were invincible and you would last forever. And then two years ago happened. And now you got the conflict going on. And then God's like, you still didn't learn your lesson yet? Guess what? They still didn't learn their lesson and they won't. All right? You know how you can prove me wrong? I'll tell you how you can prove me wrong. All right? You want to prove that book wrong? You want to prove God wrong? There's no United Nations. No United Nations, all right? The world not coming together. Then you can prove that book wrong, all right? I double dare you. I triple dare you. Go ahead and try. Even the darkest uh, people in power, they wouldn't dare do that. They need each other. They need power. They need control over the world. God knows human nature. No matter how prideful Satan is, and the scripture predicts that he's going to gather the world to worship Satan, and then they're going to fall at his feet and lose the battle, Satan don't care. He'll do it anyway. That's the same thing with these wicked people you talk to. Hey, I'm giving you a chance to prove the Bible wrong. They don't care. Yeah. They don't care. Look at Psalm 2. The Bible says in verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens, what? Uh -oh. Shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in what? Derision. Derision. 
There are some people, uh, this is eye-opening, some people think that they can try to go against the uh, New World Order system, but guess what? You're not. Even if you try to destroy it and prevent it from happening, the Bible says God's going to gather them all together. Right. You can't go against God. Right. You know, God's going to gather all those nations together, even if you think you can try to stop it. You know, some people think that, you know, Trump will save us, Trump will rescue us. But the thing is this, is that it's, it's not going to be the long term, no. Oh yeah, you had some good things happening, but how long did that last? See, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. So you can't go against God. That's why you have to be pre-tribulation, pre-millennial. If you don't believe in that, and you're a Calvinist, and you're amillennial, post-millennial then you're not a good Calvinist because there's something God ordained and he predestinated and elected that the nations will gather together against him and he's going to gather them. I'm a better Calvinist than these Calvinists. That's good. All right, if Vody Bochum's a millennial, guess what? I'm a better Calvinist than him and you tell him I said so. All right, go to Genesis 17. Genesis 17. You can't bring the kingdom on earth and you don't try, all right? Don't try. Verse 20, and as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful. So uh, God says at verse 20 about Ishmael's role, because remember, Abraham was basically kind of pleading with the Lord, won't you put your blessing on Ishmael instead? And God says, well, about Ishmael, I, already, I heard you about that, and guess what? Behold, meaning, so you know that term again, right? So look at this. Pay attention. That's the idea of behold. I already blessed him. Now, why is that? Because all you have to do is go back to Genesis 16. If you go back to Genesis 16, remember, Ishmael, his name is basically where somebody hears his cry, right? It's interesting at verse 20, God's the one that remembers his promise, even if you don't remember his promise. The language right here, he said, I have heard thee. Why would he say it that way? Because of his name, Ishmael, right? Someone who hears his cry. So God remembered his promise. So uh, God remembers his promise to Ishmael because of his very own name. God hears him. And he said that he already blessed him. So Ishmael is already blessed. So notice that uh, when people think that uh, you're being against those poor Palestinians, those poor Arabs, and no, God already remembers his promise to them. If there's any bad thing that's going on with them, it's basically two things. One, they're not staying in their... Uh, promise role that God has given to them. And number two, they go against his people. Three, because of a messed up religion. Yeah, then you wonder why. All right? That's the same thing with Christian churches. All you have to do is go uh, follow a different religious ideal and concept and churches go downhill. It's that simple. So don't say, oh, these poor people, these poor... Don't give me that. It's called sinful human nature. That's why they ended up that way, okay? So don't just give me that kind of stuff because I can play the victim role about us Christians too, you know. Oh, poor us Christians, poor us Christians here and there being persecuted in these kind of countries, uh-huh. So I can pull up that card too, so don't give me that, all right? I don't make an excuse for my own people either. The ones I preach harder than anybody is my own people, the Christians, you don't believe me? Come to church every Sunday, all right? Then you'll soon know, all right? <laughs> if we look at this passage right here at verse 20, God says that he's going to make him fruitful. So uh, remember, that's a term, fruitful, meaning pr producing seed, so having a lot of children, right? And will multiply him exceedingly. So God's going to multiply his fruit, his lineage, his seed, exceedingly. A lot of people. Twelve princes shall he beget. He's going to have twelve princes from his side. That's very similar, you'll notice, with the nation of Israel where they're going to have twelve tribes. 
So God puts his blessing on Ishmael as well. And I will make him a great nation. God's going to make uh, Ishmael's seed a great nation as well. Now we see this scripture uh, fulfilled at two places. It's Genesis 22, all right? You can write down these two passages, Genesis 22, and you can turn there if you want, Genesis 22 and Genesis 25. Genesis 22 and Genesis 25. It's going to be Genesis 22, 17. Genesis 22, 17. And the next passage will be verse 13. Verse 13. All right, Genesis chapter 22 and verse 17, and then chapter 25 and verse 13. Let me, I lost the page here. The Bible reads that in uh, blessing, in Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, that in blessing, I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed, uh, as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. All right, another one is Genesis chapter 25. Chapter 25. We see right here that Ishmael's uh, line, that he was able to possess things. That he was his, because he comes from Abraham's seed, he received some sort of blessing. Genesis chapter 25. And then uh, we'll read verse 17. The Bible reads... And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, a uh, hundred and thirty and seven years, and he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. Verse 13, and these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their generations, the firstborn of Ishmael, Nabajoth and Kedar and Abdil and Mibsam and Mishma and Duma and Massa and Hadar and Tima, Jetur, uh, Nafish and Kedima, these are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their towns and by their castles, twelve princes according to their nations. Okay, let's go back to Genesis 17 again, Genesis chapter 17. Now you notice right here that God, he is fair, and then he gives Ishmael a blessing. The problem with people nowadays, it's so funny, all right? When God has given you a blessing, it seems like this is human nature's problem. They're discontent with what God promised to them, and they get jealous of another person who receives a different promise from God, and they want that. Now, that's the problem with human nature. That is your problem, is that you're not thankful with what you have, but instead you get jealous of another person. God gives promises to different people, you have to understand. And when God gives a promise to somebody else that's not yours, don't you get jealous of it? And that other person shouldn't be jealous of you too. But guess what the problem with people is? Oh, I'm not happy with what I have. I want something else. That's the problem. The problem is you just want something new. That's it. That's your problem. You just want something new. You just want something different. So it doesn't matter if God just gave you the streets of pure gold right now. Knowing your human nature, you'd whine about that and say, what about the fish that we used to have back at Egypt? I guarantee you that. You, you people have a huge problem with that one. When I say you people, I'm including myself too. That is wicked, sinful human nature, man. Let's look at verse 21. 21. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac. So God says, however, the covenant that I'm going to establish and make is not going to be through Ishmael. It's going to be through Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So God, he gives a specific timeline in his promise. Now that's remarkable, right? If you know one thing about God, he doesn't give you a set time when he gives a promise. It's always wait, 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 you know. Sometimes you wish that God would give you like, I'm going to give you this at this time, right? Sometimes you wish that the Lord would do that, but God doesn't do it that way. So this is one of those rare promises where God puts a set time. Amen. So God says that uh, Isaac, when he's able to uh, be born through Sarah, when Sarah's able to give birth to Isaac to Abraham, it's going to be 
at this set time. What's the set time? Next year. Next year is going to happen. Now, uh, if there's a recommendation that I would give for impatient human creatures, then this is the verse that you want to mark down as one of your favorite promises, okay? <laughs> one of your favorite promises is if you're an impatient human nature and creature, one of my greatest advices is to do this. Any promise in the Bible that you see some sort of timeline, mark it down. Any promise that you see that has some sort of timeline, mark it down. And then you could be more happy. You might say, how so? Well, here's a good example. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. So meaning right here, when you get saved, it's not a process. That's the problem with people. They think it's a process, and they fear about losing their salvation. But God says, no, it's instant. It's right now, and you can have peace about it. Now, isn't that great? So then that's why you can be more happy. Another uh, passage uh, where you, uh, you can find out is his coming. His coming. He doesn't give you a specific date, but he does give you an approximate timeline. Gives you an approximate timeline, and he's given you clues. So when you read these clues in the Bible about the last days of the church age or the tribulation, and you see what's going on in our world, you shouldn't be in a panic, but more of... We should be more happy. But the problem with people is when they see these things happening, they more, what, panic. But your reaction should be the opposite. It should be joy. It should be... Wow, he's coming soon to take me out of here. So my advice is this, is that whenever you see something in the Bible that God promises and there's a time, I would mark it down if I were you. Now here's a really good one, all right, that you can get shouting. The Bible says 1 John 1, 7 and 9, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, faithful, and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, God gave you a specific timeline. When does he clean that away? As soon as you confess it, just know this. You're forgiven. All right? Sometimes it takes people, especially people you greatly hurt, uh, time to forgive you, right? Even when a Christian says that we forgive you, sometimes a Christian forgives out of obligation rather than the full heart, right? But God says, nah, 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 it's, it's under the blood, it's covered. Now you might say, why would God do that? Because you already hurt him enough with your sins on the cross, what worse can you do, right? So God's like, you've hurt me before, that's okay, I forgive you. Thank you, Lord. All right, now, claim his promise. Now it's amazing, there's a lot of promises that we've covered in Genesis 17, so I would uh, mark them down if I were you, write notes or remember them. Because your human nature is going to forget them. And you're going to get a negative mood and negative spirit again. All right, let's go back to Genesis 17, uh, verse 22. And he left off talking with him. So God, uh, basically that idea is God, he left off talking to Abraham. He went away, he, le he left. And God went up from Abraham. So God, uh, where he was down there talking to Abraham, he went up up he went away now this is pretty interesting because uh this is just a theory i could be wrong about this so this is simply a theory but what i think here is that uh if you look at chapter 17 verse 1 it says the lord appeared to abraham right it doesn't say the lord spoke to abraham so it seems to show right here he's not like up in heaven and then just speaking to him down there it's more so that God went down to meet him. If you said that uh, uh, Pastor Kim appeared, in front, uh, appeared to me, then what would that mean? He made an appearance that's present to you. So that would make sense at verse 22 when God went up from Abraham. See? So he had to go back up to heaven. I could be wrong, but from what it looks like, when you see that phrase in your Bible, the Lord appeared... It may literally mean, as it says, because that's how we take the Bible literally. He appeared. 
So it may be that case. Now, there's, if, if this is right, trust me, it's going to open up a whole can of worms. And then all you have to do is search word Lord appeared and you might come up with a deep doctrine, brother, all right? <laughs> it might happen, all right? I'm just opening up a whole can of worms right here, okay? <laughs> all right, let's go back to Genesis 17. Genesis chapter 17. It would make sense later on at Genesis 18 that I'm going to show you, all right? It's going to make sense. So just remember that. Verse 23, And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money. So we see right here that Abraham, he followed God's command to the letter. He took Ishmael his son, everyone that's born in his house, everyone that he bought with his money, so the slaves, and anybody that's the man among the men of Abraham's house. So anyone that's the male uh, among the men that is in Abraham's house, Abraham took them all. So it's like the pastor saying, all right, any of you that is a male, raise your hand. It's like you don't have freedom of choice right here. Like, no, I'm not a male. I have a different gender. No, you're a guy. You're a guy. Every male has to help out in cleaning the office or to clean up the kitchen or to set up the room. So it's kind of like that. So Abraham... Uh, took these people, imagine this, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the self-same day. Imagine that. Abraham's, imagine the pastor saying, how many of you are males right here? <laughs> all right, all of you have to be circumcised. Let's go. And you're like, what? You know, but uh, what about the five years old? Olds? Go, circumcision, let's go. <laughs> so Abraham, notice right here, he followed God's command to the letter to the letter right here. So it shows right here, Abraham, he, there's one thing you know about him. He follows God. He obeys God. He doesn't think about, you know, why this way, why that way. No, he just follows and obeys God. He believes. It says right here, the next part of verse 23, and circumcise the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day. So uh, what we see right here is that Abraham... Uh, he followed God's uh, command where he circumcised the flesh of their foreskin at the very same exact day as God had said unto him. Notice exactly what God told him to do. So he followed. And Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. Notice that Abraham was 99 years old when he got his foreskin in his flesh, in his body, circumcised. So he didn't think about his old age either. He just did it. Now, uh, verse 23 through 24 is a good example, uh, probably a leader or a pastor who does not compromise and who does not make excuses, but just does it to a T and leads it well. Verse 25, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So that's self-explanatory. Uh, his son Ishmael, when he got circumcised uh, in his body, when his body received circumcision, it, he was 13 years of age. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son. That's self-explanatory. In that exact same day, Abraham and Ishmael both received circumcision. And all the men of his house, born in the house and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Self-explanatory. Everybody that is a man who was in Abraham's house, whether they were born in his house or they were bought of a money from outsiders as slaves, they were circumcised with Abraham. He followed, he was very thorough in obeying God's command. So this, is, this can actually make a very good sermon, believe it or not. If you go 23 through 27, it'll be a very good sermon one day. All right, chapter 18, Genesis chapter 18. Now, let's see what we can cover in here. Verse 1, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So notice right here, God appears to Abraham in this location, plains of Mamre. Remember, he was sojourning there. That's what happened when Lot was uh, uh, kidnapped or taken as a slave, as prisoner by the five kings. Abraham was, resi Abraham was residing there. Uh, he was sitting in front of the flap of the tent, or at the entrance of the tent. That's the idea, meaning tent door. It's the English phrase and expression. And this was at the heat of the day. So you can see this is at the middle of the day when it's really hot. 
And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. So it was the heat of the day, so you can imagine his head was down because it was very hot, trying to avoid of the sun. But once he started to lift up his eyes and look, then uh, all of a sudden, that's the idea, lo, it's like lo and behold, so like all of a sudden, here's what happened. Then three men stood right, uh, stood right by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So Abraham, what he did at the heat of the day was, uh, and then just walked. No, he, when he saw them, it's interesting, he, this is the heat of the day. He ran to meet them from his, the entrance of his tent, ran to them, bowed toward the ground in front of them. And then verse 3 and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. So Abraham is speaking to these three men, but he says, My Lord, singular. So there's one person here he addresses as his Lord. And he says, uh, If you found favor, if, uh, from how you see it, right? If you see any favor in me, then please don't pass by me. Just, I'm begging you, I'm beseeching you, I urge you, I pray thee, you know, from your servant speaking here, don't pass away from me. Now, that's a good hymn right now, where you recall, uh, pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. So we can see that he was speaking to the Lord. And that's very plain when you look at verse 13, the Lord is speaking to Abraham. So there's no doubt that this is uh, God Almighty, but verse 1 was very plain, and the Lord appeared unto him. Now, see that? Lord appeared unto him, matched with chapter 17, verse 1, the Lord appeared. But when the Lord appeared at chapter 18, we see that he comes down in his pre-incarnate state, uh, state again. So he comes down in human form again. The Lord appears to Abraham. And Abraham, when he sees them, he ran toward them. So it's not like it's a stranger that Abraham doesn't know. Now listen up. That person is not a stranger to Abraham then. Abraham knew this would be God. And so he ran to meet them. Now that speaks volumes. You might say, why is that? This speaks volumes because you see at verse 3, he wants to spend time with his Lord. You see at verse 2, he was eager to talk and meet, to meet his Lord. You see at, when you combine that with chapter 17, verse 1, 22, and chapter 18, verse 1, this is what I think. What I think is Abraham had such sweet fellowship and communion with God that he knew that when he looked around, who would be the Lord? Okay. So he had such a deep, intimate relationship with God that he would recognize who the Lord was. But that's just guesswork on my part. I don't know how else he could recognize him. But it would make sense to me because he experienced that before the Lord appeared to him. Uh, chapter 17, verse 1, in previous chapters. And not only that, if you look at James 2, James 2, he's one of the few people who received this title from God. Look at James 2. Now, I wonder if you read that book so much, you pray to God so much, you have a very close relationship with God, that you would know who God is once you went, got raptured to heaven. <laughs> Like out of all those millions of people you come across in heaven, you would recognize who's the one, who is God. People who would know is people who have such a close, intimate relationship with God. Not people who say, I saw a blonde, blue, a blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. They don't know God. Even if God appeared right in front of them that way through a vision or something, they don't know God. They think that's an intimate relationship. That's not. That's called experience. That's called fleshly sensation experience. Look at James chapter 2, verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, 
And he was called what? The friend of God. If you study Abraham's life, he had a quiet time with God too. So do you have your quiet time with God? Quiet time means your Bible reading time, your prayer time, and even memorizing verse time or studying doctrine time. So do you have a quiet time with God? Abraham did. That's why he recognized who God was. I wonder if you would too. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that today's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers. May this understand each and every word and verse from that precious book. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.